Yay. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> so we were in the middle of something last time. Let me remind you where we were. So um, so we were in the middle of proving the following theorem. That the following triple, so consisting of the K element subsets of an N element set, the group generated by this N cycle, and then finally the Q binomial coefficient, N choose K, that satisfies this exhibits cyclic sieving. And let me just remind you what that means. What that means is that if you look at the fixed points of the group action, they can be enumerated by taking this polynomial and choose K and plugging in roots of unity of the same degree, right? And last time what we did was we enumerated the fixed points and we saw that they were either no fixed points or this binomial coefficient. So we now need to show that when we plug in roots of unity, we get the same formula, right? Does everybody remember how that goes? Okay, so we need to see that we've got, yes, Aditya. Uh, so does any root, <laughs> so does any root of unity with the same order work? Yes, it only, dip, all, all you need to do is know the order. You don't need to know the particular root of that order, Okay, as we will see. Other questions? Uh, Thomas, somehow you're in front of the board. Can you move? <laughs> Can people see what I've written even though Thomas is there? Yes. Okay, well then I'll, ke I'll keep writing until, yeah, Nicholas. No, sorry, I was trying to oh, unmute to say I can not also see the board. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I, I with all this technology, it's easy to do things you didn't think you were going to be doing. So we had done that part of the proof in two claims, A and B last time, and now we have a new claim, which is going to help us with the root of unity part. So call it claim C. Suppose you have a root of unity Omega is what we were using for root of unities, say of order D, uh, omega not equal to the identity element one, okay. Uh, Nicholas? Um, you... Do you mind if we add the little subscript Q to distinguish the polynomial just for writing it out? If you wish to do that, fine. Remember, I have this convention that says that if I don't, I can either put in the subscript or not, as long as okay. it's clear from context. And if it's not clear from context, just ask. Okay. okay. Other questions? So I've got my omega, and I've got some integer n, positive and non-negative integer n, so n greater than or equal to zero. Two things. First of all, if I look at brackets n sub q, and I'm going to put the q here to make it clear, right? So this is the polynomial version of n. That has omega as a simple root, right? Simple means just of multiplicity 1. If d divides n, right? So if the order of omega divides the number that I'm taking the Q analog of. And in the other cases, if D does not divide N, it's non-zero. And maybe to be more specific, I should say, if I plug it into that polynomial, 
right? So I'm substituting omega for Q that is non-zero if D does not divide in. Okay. And then the second identity, which is the one that we really, this is just a, one is just a warm up for the following. Suppose we have two integers, M and N, which are congruent mod D. Then if I take So I want to plug in omega to the fraction m over n, brackets m over brackets n. But I can't necessarily do that directly because remember, sometimes there's zero when I do that. So I have to take a limit here. So in this case, the limit as q approaches omega of mq over nq It's one of two values. It's either m over n, the numbers m over n, that's if d divides n, and it's one otherwise. Okay? Everybody clear what we're trying to prove before we go ahead and prove it? Any questions about the statement? Okay. So I'm going to just prove part of one for you and the rest of it I'm going to leave as an exercise. So let me show you what happens in one if D divides N. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that N can be written as K times D. So therefore, what does brackets N look like? Well, by definition, it's one plus Q plus Q squared ending at one less than this. So Q to the K D minus one. And now we're gonna rewrite this in a very nice sort of way. We're gonna take the first D terms. Remember, we're starting with Q to the zero. So those will be one through Q to the D minus one. And then we're going to take the next d terms, right? So that'll be q to the d through q to the 2d minus 1. And you keep breaking it up like that, right? Taking it d terms by d terms. Everybody see what I'm doing? The first one I'm going to leave alone. The second one, what can I factor out of this second sum here? Q to the D. Q to the D, clearly, right? And when I do that, what am I left with? I'm left with exactly the same thing that I had in the first sum, right? What can I factor out of the next sum? The next sum is going to start with Q to the 2 d and so we can factor that out and keep going notice what is common to all of these things the one plus through the q to the d minus one right so this is one plus plus q to the d minus one times one plus q to the d plus q to the two d. And this will end with q to the k minus one d if you work it out. Okay, everybody happy with that factorization? Any questions? Great. Okay, so I'm running out of space here. Well, I'm just going to go to the next and make a new slide.
Well, let's look at each of those factors individually. What happens with the second factor if I plug in omega, right? Then I've got one plus, so let's say this. So if Q equals omega in the second factor, what do I get? I get one plus omega to the D plus omega to the 2D plus plus omega to the K minus 1D. Can anybody tell me what this is? Remember, omega was a dth root of unity. So if I raise omega to the D, what do I get? One. one. And if I remain at it, raise it to the 2D, still one. Yes, John is holding up the right, the only finger one needs to hold up. So this is just one added to itself K times. So that's K, which is not zero, right? So this part of it is not going to contribute any. Right, there are no roots in this part of the, the thing. What about in the other part? Well, in the other part, let's remember, what is one minus Q to the D? That factors as one minus Q times one plus Q plus Q to the D minus one. Right, because if I multiply this by one, I get that polynomial, that sum, and then when I multiply by minus Q, everything in the middle cancels and you just get a telescoping sum with the first and the last term, okay? So, but think about it. What are the factors of one minus Q to the D? It's just all the dth roots of unity, right? So here are the factors and they each occur exactly once. Right, so this has has all dth roots of one exactly once. But if that's true, that's got to be true of the right side. So these, but notice this first factor, which root does that have? Just the root one, exactly. So all the other dth roots of unity must be in this sum exactly once. And that is exactly what we, we, we wanted to show. So this has also got to happen here. And so that's the end of showing what happens when D divides N. Questions? Any questions about that? Okay, great. So now let me prove the final claim. Let me first of all get the final claim up on my screen here. Which is as follows. Claim D. Okay, so I've got my D root of unity, my primitive D root of unity, order D. And we're assuming D divides N. Then if I plug this into this polynomial, right now I'm plugging in, I'm substituting for Q omega, I get one of two things. It's either the binomial coefficient n over d choose k over d, if d also divides k, not just n but k, and it's zero otherwise. Have we seen that expression before? Yeah, it's exactly the expression we saw for the fixed points. So this will this will finish us off, right? This will show that those two things are actually always equal. Everybody agree that if we can prove this, we're done. Okay, good. So yes, uh, Aditya. 
Um, for the previous part, did we not do the MS comment? Yes, one? as I said, I'm, I'm leaving that as an exercise. That that will be on your exercises oh, okay. for this. Sorry, sorry. Other oh, sorry. other questions. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, let's prove this. The crucial thing is let's write this thing out in terms of factorials. Right? By definition, this was brackets n factorial over brackets k factorial times brackets n minus k factorial. And as usual, with ordinary factorials, we can cancel the n minus k factorial into the n factorial, right? That'll get rid of the bottom terms. And we can write this as just the remaining n factors on the top That's an n minus k plus one. Let me write that better. I can fix it. I'm getting a clicking noise. Is anybody else hearing that? No? Okay, then I'll ignore it. And the k factorial, I'm going to write this way. I wonder if that's complaining about my headset. Let me just plug it in. There it is. Well, that didn't seem to help it. Anyway, I'll just ignore the clicking if nobody else is hearing it. Okay, so there's two cases. We got to deal with both of them separately. What happens if D divides K, right? That's the, the first case. Well, if D divides K and D also divides N, then N and K are both congruent modulo D, right? Because they're both congruent to zero. So in particular, that means that if I can subtract I from both of them and preserve that congruence, But that previous claim that I had about the limit, this was exactly what I needed to do about taking those limits. That if the top and the bottom, if you look back at that, of the limit should have the same congruence class. So by that claim, let's do this. So this is using, let me actually go back here. So, come on. This was cl claim to the C, the second part. What do I get? I guess we're going to have to start a new board. Mm -hmm. Right. So when I do this substitution, 
I'm taking the limit as Q approaches omega. Look at each of these factors, N over K, and then N minus one over K minus one. and so forth. Let me erase this so that it looks better. Well, again, if you look back at that claim, it said if the two things, top and bottom, were congruent to zero, then the limit was just equal to that fraction, right? So that first one will just become N over K. That was part of the claim, if you go back and look at it. When they weren't congruent to zero, it said that that fraction would become one. Okay? Again, just going back and looking at the previous claim. Yes, question, Judy. Oh, sorry. I don't really think I have a question. I don't know why my hand is moving. Oh, okay. Not a problem. And those, so now for the ones that aren't congruent to zero mod D, we're going to get a bunch of ones. When is the next time we were going to get top and bottom both congruent to something mod, to zero mod D? What is going to be, what is that going to give us? N minus D. Exactly, when we get to N minus D over K minus D, right? Those are now again zero mod D because N and, M, N and K were zero mod D. And then you're going to get another bunch of ones. And then you're going to get N minus 2D over K minus 2D. And then you're going to get a bunch of ones and this just keeps going. Okay, everybody happy with that? Good. Well, now let's just do some simple division. Divide top and bottom of each of these by D. This is N over D and K over D, right? If I can divide top and bottom by the same thing, doesn't change anything. The ones we can ignore, divide the top of this by D, what do you get? You get N over D minus one, right? D over D is one and K over D minus one. What's the next one going to give me? N over D minus two. Yeah, I think somebody is saying it. It'll be N over D minus two, K over D minus two. What am I getting? I'm getting N over D, choose K over D. Right? It's exactly after you do cancellation, what you get on the top and the bottom. And for the claim when D is not devising K, I'm again going to leave that as an exercise. Okay, so this will finish, this finishes everything. Any questions about this proof? Judy, was is that a hand? Yes, that's an actual hand. So do we go from um, a Q binomial to an actual binomial? Exactly, right? Okay. Because remember, we're plugging in a number. Oh. We're plugging, it, it's no longer a, fu a function of Q, it's a function of omega, and omega is oh. a number, it's a complex number. Oh, so I we see. expect to get a number out. We don't expect necessarily to get a, a, a an integer out, but we expect to get a number out. Okay. Other Thank questions? You. Other questions? Okay, well, we're gonna switch topics here then. So I wanna show you some other cool actions that, are, that we can talk about. So this one is one that's been receiving a lot of attention recently, and it's called row motion.
So I'm going to have to do a bunch of review first about parse the ordered sets, but this should be not too hard. Most of you will should be familiar with these definitions, but just to make sure. So we're going to have a parse the ordered set P and its partial order will be denoted less than or equal to be a finite poset. And we're going to be looking at various sets of elements. So the set of anti-chains of P, I'm going to be denoted that as script A of P, and it's the set of all subsets of P which form an anti-chain. What that means is that no two elements of A are comparable. Okay, so you just take a bunch of elements, but you can't have one less than another. That's not allowed in an anti-chain. So the picture is, if the, I use kind of, right, if that's the uh, Hasse diagram of P, then your anti-chain is going to be a bunch of elements. No one is above the other. So you can think of this like kind of as a row of elements, right? Because you can't have one on top of another. That's where the row and row motion comes from, just so that you know. Okay, another standard concept is order ideals. So the set of lower order ideals. And I will often leave out lower or an order and just say ideal. So if I say ideal, I mean a lower order ideal. I'm going to denote that by script I of P. So that's going to be the ideals in P. So remember, a lower order ideal in P is a set I that satisfies the following. If I take an element of I and I take anything smaller than it, then that smaller thing has got to still be an I. So it's closed under going down. You can think of it that way. And the picture again is it's everything below a certain point that would be your lower order ideal. Everything on down, going down from someplace. Similarly, we have the upper order ideals of P. I use U for that, U for upper, and you just reverse the inequalities that we had before. If X is in my upper ideal and Y is bigger than X, then Y is in my upper ideal. And again, you just reverse the, you get everything above a certain point. Okay, so everybody happy with these three sets? Anti chains, lower order deals, upper ideals. Any questions? Great. Thanks for the thumbs up, Ben and, and Nicholas. Okay, so these three sets are actually equinumerous. There's nice bijections between them all. So let me show you those bijections, and they're very simple bijections. So the following are bijections. First of all, what I'm going to call the down map.
the down map will take us from anti-chains to lower order ideals. And it's done in exact this very simplest way. If I want to take the down map and apply it to an anti-chain, I just take all the y and p that are less than or equal to some element of the anti-chain. Okay, so let's start an example here. Suppose P is this poset. So it's a nine element poset and the nine elements look like a tilted box, okay? And let's let A, so the, I'm gonna denote sets, subsets of P by making their, the dots really big. So this element and this element. Okay, so that's my anti-chain, these two elements here. How many things will be in the down set of A? Yeah, Ben has got it, four, right? Because you've got to have, right, the down set is just going to be everything below this leftmost element, and that's going to give me the left side of the square. And then this element, everything below it, doesn't add anything but the element itself. Everybody clear what the down map looks like? Questions? Great. Okay, very good. Next we have, guess what? The up map. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do I need to define the up map to, precisely or are or people think they can? Yeah, okay. There is a corresponding, corresponding up map. U, which now will take an anti-chain and give you an upper order ideal. And again, just to make absolutely sure, what is U, how many elements are in U of A here? Yes, you need both hands for this one, seven elements, right? Because it looks like this. Okay, everybody happy? Great. So, and then a map which we can have on all sets, but we're gonna look at it as a in a particular case, the complement map. which we're going to consider as a map from the ideals, lower order ideals, to the upper order ideals. And it's just by taking set theoretic complement. Complement of an ideal I is the set of all Y and P, which are not in I. Right, so what would, if we use this as my ideal I, what is the complement gonna look like? How many elements? Yeah, exactly. There's gonna be the undotted things and there are five of them. Okay, questions about these maps, what they do, everything clear, hopefully. Great, okay, so. One more, one, 
two more maps and then we'll be done with the the and we can define the big map that we're actually after here i guess we'll do it here so this is going to be for any set of subset of p so for any subset s of p we're going to define the min and the max maps. So the min of S, well, it's kind of exactly what you'd expect. It's all the things in S that have nothing below them. So there is no, no Y in S with Y below X. You can't go any smaller than X and stay in S. And similarly, we have the max map. But just reverse the inequalities. So for example, just to make absolutely sure, suppose <clears throat> let's take S to be this set. What does min S, how many elements are in min S? Two, right? These two minimals. And max s, what about that? One, exactly the top element. Okay. So here is the big definition. Row motion on ideals, or on anti-chains first, we'll do anti-chains. So row motion row motion on anti-chains. This is going to be denoted rho, and it's going to be a map from anti-chains to anti-chains. And it's the composition that starts off, so rho is going to start off in the anti-chain world. It's going to use the down map to give me an ideal, lower order ideal. It then uses the complement map to give me an upper order ideal. And then it finally uses the min map to give me another anti chain. Okay, so it's this three step process. So, for example, Going back to our example, if I started with this very first anti-chain that I had, right, then that would go by down to this lower order ideal. Then I would complement And then I would take the mins, which would give me this anti-chain. So therefore, rho applied to this anti-chain will give me this anti-chain. Everybody see how this three-step process works. Any questions? Okay. Yes, uh, Judy. Um, so 
it will make a difference if I first. Uh, Judy, can you speak a little louder? Oh, I'm having trouble yes. hearing. So it will make a difference if I first take the upper. Yes, you will get a different map okay. then. It it will actually turn out to be like the map we're looking at, but it will be a different map. Okay. So you have to do it in this order. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so you can also do it on ideals in exactly the same sort of way. So right, we've got this three-step process. Well, we can just start at a different point in that process and get a similar sort of map. So row motion on ideals. So this is going to be denoted row hat. So I'm going to use hats whenever I'm talking about ideals rather than anti-chains. So this is going to, and that's because the hat looks like a, a, a lower order ideal with one maximal element. That's the where this comes from. So it's going to be a map from ideals to ideals. And you just start with the ideal and then go around this process. So you start with your ideal, you complement to get an upper order ideal, you take the mins to take an anti-chain, and then finally you take your down set to get another ideal. So similar sort of thing. Okay, so let's do a really simple example to, to end the session. Let's do it, the, one of the, what's one of the simplest possible post sets out there? Well, a chain. Chains are really straightforward, so let's, and, but it'll be instructive. So let's look at, so the N chain is just going to be brackets n, the numbers one through n, with the usual less than or equal to on the integers. So let's do a quick example. What is the three chain going to look like? Well, you have one at the bottom. Yeah, exactly. Judy's pointing in the right directions, then you'll have two covering that, and then you'll have three covering that. Okay, everybody clear what the end, end chain is. Well, let's, great, Nicholas. Uh, let's now see what row motion looks like. So find the orbits of row. Orbits of row. Well, we'll start off with the simplest possible anti-chain, the empty chain. What will be the next ideal? Well, think about it. What's the empty chain? We start, what do we do? We take the, yeah, then seize it, just to make sure everybody else does, right? We take the empty chain, we take everything smaller than the empty chain. How many things are smaller than the empty chain? None, right? It's still empty. Now we take the complement. What's the complement of the empty set here? It's everything, and what's now we take the minimum element. What's the minimum of the of of all the elements? It's one, right? So the next thing here is going to be the element, and again, one. Just using a big. Now we're going to do it again, right? One. What sort of a lower order ideal does it generate? Just itself, right? Now. We take the complement. The complement gives us the elements what? Two and three. And now we take the minimum of those, which is what? Two, exactly. Guess what is going to happen next? What element do you suppose is going to, <laughs> we're going to get three as the next element by exactly the same thing? What's going to happen now? We take the lower order ideal generated by three, but that's everything. 
complement is going to be empty set. Exactly, Judy. And so therefore, it's going to bring us back to the empty set. And those are all the ideals, the, all the anti-chains rather, right? You just have a single, these single element anti-chains here. So we have a single orbit. And that's always true. So here's the, the thing that you're going to prove as an exercise following proposition. row motion on the end chain has a single orbit single orbit of length n plus 1 okay so that's it for the first lecture. We'll see you back in a little over 10 minutes. Or actually, did you want to? Um, yes, yeah. let's do a full 15 minutes break. So okay, full 15 minutes at, break. Then, yeah, so five we'll, five. why do we say it to, yeah, 11.05. Oh. We'll yeah. see you back here. Not a problem, not a problem. So um, that example we did at the last end of last period with the chain, obviously that's too simple for, <laughs> to publish anything about. So we need to look at something uh, a little bit more complicated. And so maybe we should put the chains together in some sort of nice way. And that's exactly what we're gonna do now. So we're gonna talk about fences. And I should mention that this is all joint work from a paper with Sergi Elizalde. Matt Plant. Tom Roby. And myself. So let me tell you what a fence is. So we've got our post set. Oh, and first I'm gonna tell you a more general definition that you're probably familiar with, but just to make sure. So in a post set P, then X is covered by Y. covered and in that case we're going to write x and then a little triangle y first of all x has got to be smaller than y and there's nothing in between so there's no z that sits in between them. Okay, is it clear what a cover is? Just two things which are consecutive in, in, the, in the Hase diagram. So then a fence is a post set, we use F for fences. The elements of the post set will be labeled say x1 through xn and here are the covers that we're going to have so we're going to start 
like a chain, right? We're going to start X1 is going to be covered by X2, and that's going to be covered by X3, and then we're going to go up the chain until we get to some XA. And then we're going to start to go down. XA plus 1 is going to be covered by XA, and we keep doing that until we get to some XB. And then we go back up again, if possibly. And we just keep doing this. We keep going back and forth between going up and down chains. So I think this will be clearest if we look at the this. Can everybody read that central? Excellent. OK, so here. Ignore this notation for the second. Here we have, uh, let me see whether I can make that a little bit bigger. Here we have a fence, right, where we go up x1, x2, x3, and then down x4, x5, x6, and then up and then back down, right? So that would be a, a, a typical fence. Okay, good. So some terminology to do with these fences. So the maximal chains of S, the maximal chains of F, are called segments. And I'm going to number the segments from left to right, S1 through, say, ST. Okay. So going back to our example here, how many segments does that, that top fence have? Yeah, exactly, four, right? First one going up, second one going down, next one up, and then next one down. Now, elements which are on two segments, two segments are called shared, and I'm always going to put shared elements in red, and the others are unshared. And those are always going to be in black. Okay, so again, going back to that example, how many th shared elements do we have? Three, right? Exactly. Everybody's putting up the right number of fingers, right? The, the top of the first two segments, the bottom of the next two, and then the top of the, the last two. And then the rest of them are unshared. Question, Maria. I have a very silly question that is, I'm probably just misunderstanding. You set up, it's a post set with these elements that go up and down. Are we imagining like a bigger post set that this is a sub post set of, no, or is the fence no, no, the entire this is it. Set? This is it. This, okay. is, this is going so, to be complicated enough. <laughs> okay. It consists of the only the elements X1 through XN then. Okay. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Not a sub post set of anything else. Got it. Other questions? Should I wait to ask about the numbers? Like yes, yes, okay. yes. I'm getting to the numbers. Yeah, okay. no, I, I, I will explain the numbers in, in right now. As a matter of fact, Lisa, that's a perfect <laughs> leading question. So what is this notation? So we're going to write F is equal to F. Whoopsie, that should be an F. And I'm going to put a little U on the top. U is for unshared of parameters alpha 1 through alpha T, where alpha I is defined to be 1 plus the number of 
unshared elements on the i segment. Now, you might think it would be more normal or more natural to take alpha i to just be the number of unshared elements, but it turns out that with this, it gives much prettier theorems. So that's, that's the reason for doing this, even though it seems a little unnatural. So let's go back. To, now let's explain the examples here. What's going on? Well, whoopsie, I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to move the board. Well, how many unshared elements are there on the first segment? Two. That's why the first thing in F with the U is three, right? It's one more than the number of unshared elements. Mm -hmm. The number of unshared elements on the second segment is also two, which explains the second three. Number of unshared elements on the third segment is one, and one more than that is the two in F sub U. Everybody see where these numbers are coming from now. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Good. Excellent. So that's the notation we're going to use. So, and we're always going to use T for the number of segments. So T will be the number of segments. Just for notation. So what we're going to do is we're going to, rather than dealing with these things directly, we're going to look at a, a model of them using tilings. So let me get that image up again. And move it over to where we want it to be in the middle, say, maybe right about here. Okay. So, Yeah, thanks. Yeah. If you made it bigger, that's great. Thanks. <laughs> that was me. Yeah, great. So we're going to associate with each anti chain in this fence. An a or a a t by one column of boxes. And we're going to color the bo the boxes, and here's how we're going to do it. So color the box in row I, one of three colors. It's just going to use the color scheme we're already using it. We'll color the box red if the anti-chain intersects the i segment in a shared element we're going to color it black if this intersection is an unshared element and we're going to color it yellow if there is no intersection So yellow means there's nothing there. Okay, so let's go back to this. And so you can, oopsie, sorry. So you can see. So let's look at figure two, right? That, that um, second fence down from the top. So notice the anti-chain we're taking here is X1, X4, and X8. And look at the corresponding columns, right? The corresponding column it's going to have four boxes, right? Because we're four segments. That what does that top black box correspond to in the anti-chain? Which x? X sub 
one exactly right and then the second black box is for x sub four and then the two red boxes are both for x sub yes you got to use both hands eight right everybody see how the coloring worked mm -hmm. okay similarly take the next one below it and notice this next one below it is what you get by applying row motion to the anti-chain we were just discussing okay so now we have a, a black box in the for, for the first segment, and there is nothing on the next three segments, so they're all yellow. Everybody see how these colorings are, are made. Okay, so now what we're going to do is, now we've got a, a, one of these for each coloring. Whoopsie, I didn't want that. Well, I suppose it's okay over there. We now put the columns of an orbit... O together on a cylinder, right? Because the orbit wraps around. And what we do once we do that is we let adjacent red boxes in the same column form a tile, form a single tile. And we do the same thing with black boxes in the same row. So, and let black boxes in the same row form a tile. Okay, so now let's go back to this picture. So below I've put a corresponding tiling for an orbit of F U four three four. Yeah, question. There's a question Nicholas has said. Hey. Yes, Nicholas. Um, is there a specific motivation why like the red boxes are turned into tiles horizontally and the or sorry, vertically and the black ones horizontally? Like Yes, yes, okay. there is a good reason. And that's a great question. I'm about to to, uh, uh, to talk about that now. But that's 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 very good. Well, for the red boxes, you can kind of see these two red boxes will now form a tile like this, a vertical tile. But remember, these two red boxes both corresponded to a single element. So it makes sense to merge them. Okay. What about these boxes? Well, remember, this is starting with four three unshared elements and then a top element. If you think about it, what's happening on the individual segments is exactly like what we saw happening on the chain. So this first black box that was merged is the lowest unshared element on the segment. The next black box is the next lowest element on the unshared segment and so forth as you just you just move up the segment just exactly the way you moved up the chain and that's why we're putting them all into one big tile. Mm -hmm. And notice we also have, right, I, this is a cylinder. These two ends are, are going to be put together. Sometimes that's going to cut a tile. So this tile here starts here and then re right, reappears here. That's the same tile. Other questions? Does this, did this explain what you, what you had? Good. Any other questions? John, is that a question or? Looks like Lee's hand up. Uh, Lee, yeah. Um, <clears throat> would we ever have two vertices on the same like fence post? I'm like, not sure what you mean by a fence post. Oh, like the one of the um one of the diagonal lines, like a single one. Like, would we have X 
one, two, three, four, and X five at the same time selected. That's not uh, an anti chain. You need an anti-chain. Okay, okay. Remember, you've got anti-chains. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very important. These are anti-chains. These are not ideals. Yeah, okay. Other questions? Okay. So what can we do with this? Rather than trying to describe the orbits directly, we're going to describe the tilings that come from these orbits. Okay. And here's the description. So, if you have a vector alpha 1 through alpha t, which you should think of as your parameters for your fence, then an alpha tiling is a tiling CT of your cylinder by, so you're going to have three types of tiles, right? You're going to have yellow tiles. Those are going to be one by one tiles, right? You can see here, each of these yellow tiles is just a single box. We don't do any merging. One by one tiles. What about the red tiles? What are their dimensions going to be? Two by one. Yeah, Laura, did you have a hand or is that? No, okay. So red two by one tiles, right? Covering two rows in one column. And black, these black tiles get merged in the following way. I'm gonna to have to, whoa. Okay. So in black, so the size of the black tiles is going to be right? They're all in a given row. So they're one. And then the dimensions, the number of black tiles in the column will be one by alpha i minus one in row i. Such that the following two conditions hold. Tiling condition one if alpha i is bigger than one. This is just a condition to say that there can be black tiles in the i-th row and red tiles are ignored. Then the black and yellow ones alternate. Let's look at that in this example down below. Look at the very first row. So ignore that first red tile there. And then it goes yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black. And then when you wrap around yellow, black. So it's always just going back. Everybody see what T1 means. You're just, you're just alternating there. And then T2 is about the red tiles. So there's a red tile. covering rows say i and i plus one if and only if one of two things happens depending upon the parity of i i is odd and the next column
contains two yellow tiles in those positions. And then a similar sort of thing if I is even, if I is even. And in that case, it's the previous column that contains the two yellow tiles. Again, this will be easiest to see in an example. Look at this red tile. The top of the red tile is in which row? Uh, One, which is odd. So we're in case A. Case A tells you that ex after this red tile, you must immediately have two yellow tiles. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about this red tile? Now the first top is in box two. So we're in the second case, and that tells you that it has to have two red, yellow tiles immediately before it, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So this, it's this parity. Odd rows, two tile red, yellows after, even rows, two tiles before. Question, Aditya. Was that a question? Yeah. Does a yeah. fence post it always go up first? I'm sorry, say what? Uh, uh, does... A little louder. It's hard for me to hear. Does a fence post always go up? First? Yes, yes. Okay. We're, ah. we're, we're standardizing so that it always goes up first. Okay. Other sense. questions? Judy. Um, like over here, right? Can over I where? Like, a, like oops. I, I can't see what you're, you're writing, unfortunately. Um, the first row, sorry, the first column of the red, like red, red, This black. column here? Yeah. Yeah, um, what about it? Like, should I have another red, red, black? Are you just suppressing that? Should you have another? Again, I'm, it's hard for me to hear. Oh, sorry. Should I have another red, red, and black there for the another column for the four, 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 three, four? Uh, or, I'm not sure what you, I mean, this column has got a single red tile and then a black, part of a black tile at the bottom. Yeah. Should I have like, um, a copy of that next to no, that? No, no, this does not have another copy of that. Oh, and why do we not have a copy of that? Aha, uh -huh, because remember, our rule is that if you, if, what well, it, it just doesn't, it does not occur. Oh, if, okay. if you, if you write Sorry. out the, if you write out the orbit, this, these are the tiles you will get. These, these are the columns you will get. You just won't mm -hmm. get another column of that type. Okay. I don't know whether that answers your question, Laura. Does anybody uh, more Maria? No question. Uh, oh, did did Laura? Did you have a question? No, no. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I maybe I could. Um, yeah, uh, address this if you for, can for Judy. What I think um, she's asking is the like the reason you won't have another red after a red, and the reason you'll have the two yellows after the red is because that indicates that you have a red on the top of a fence that goes like up and down, an up and down sort of peak. At a peak, right. you'll have a red dot, and then when you do the row motion, you take the you're thinking of the lower order ideal, you take the complement, now the complement's like empty above that. And so you actually end up with those two sort of parts of the segments of the fence being empty. And so that's why it has to be yellow after right, the red. Right. So you can't yeah, have so... a red followed by a red. It's it's that red dot is going to disappear just like in that example above. I Whereas see. I think my understanding is on the lower one in case B, it's where the red dot is a, a valley, right? Exactly, and that's got to be because the previous time you had an, nothing on the two. Right, you had segments. nothing, so you take the complement, and now the bottom is part of your anti-chain. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. that makes sense. Does that, did that yeah. clear it up? Yes. Okay, great. Cool. Anything else? Okay, so... So the theorem is, let's start a new whiteboard, is that these tilings are the same as the orbits. So for all parameters alpha, the correspondence above or say this correspondence 
is a bijection. between orbits and alpha tilings. So you, if you want to tell something about the orbit, you just look at its corresponding tiling, and that will give you what you want. OK? So. Let's see how that can help us give you some homo messies. So some definitions for some functions that are going to be useful for us. Suppose we have an X in the fence. Yeah, that should be a fence. Ooh, that was not a good choice, was it? Yeah, we'll work, we'll work with it. Let's look at the characteristic map. Chi X of an anti-chain will just be one, if x is in the anti-chain, and zero otherwise. OK? And we're also going to want to look at chi of the anti-chain, of the full anti-chain, with no subscript. And that's just going to be the cardinality. So for example, Right. Is it clear what these two, two things do? And do we need an example? OK, great. So, and you can analogously define define chi hat for ideals, both with a subscript and without. OK, and then finally, just a little bit of notation. For a tiling T, we're going to let B sub I be the number of black tiles. in row i, and r sub i be the number of red tiles. OK. So uh, let's see. Yeah, question. Oh, not a question. OK. So here is a, a simple proposition that you can prove. If x and y are on the same segment, then the characteristic function, the difference of the characteristic functions chi x and chi y is zero mesic. OK, so let's see how we could prove this. OK, just to make notation, suppose x and y are on the i segment. Okay, and let T be a tiling uh, 
for a say orbit here. o question question ben? uh yeah are we making any assumption as to whether or not uh x and y could potentially be shared elements or... uh in this we're saying they're on the same segment yes unshared thank you that's very important Thank you for pointing that out. That's very important. They have to be unshared. They have to be both unshared. Thank you. Hmm. Other corrections or, or questions? Okay, well, think about it. Remember, how did these black tiles end up? You have a black, a, a square and a black tile for each unshared element on a segment. So if I look in a particular row for that, for that element for the EI segment, how many, how, how can I count how many times X appears? What will that be? It'll be the number of black tiles, right? Each black tile contains an, a, 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 a unique element, a unique square in that black tile, which corresponds to X. Does everybody see that? Okay, so what I'm saying is there is a unique, a unique black, uh, black box or in each black tile. Tile in row I corresponding oh. to X. So therefore, the number of times X appears in my orbit is just the number of black tiles in my the i row. Everybody happy with that? But wait a second, does this argument change if I look at Y? No, right? Y is also an unshared element. It's the exact same, <laughs> we got the exact same thing. But, but wait a second. So similarly, chi Y of the orbit is equal to bi. So therefore, what about their difference? Chi x minus chi y, what is that? Well, it's bi minus bi, which I think is always <laughs> zero. <laughs> <laughs> We're done. So you see how simple these arguments come become by looking at the tiling. The tiling really gives you power in order to make these kind of statements. Any questions about that? So one of the reasons I wanted to show you this work was because we found in it a new notion that had not been studied before, but which seems to, this is not the only case we found of this new thing appearing, but it hasn't been as much studied as homo messy. So I think there's a lot more to do and therefore might be useful for a thesis project or something like that. So this is what we call homometry. So what is homometry? So give you the general definition, not just for offense. So G is acting on X. On X. And then we'll say that a statistic from X to the non-negative integers is homometric 
So not homomesic, but homometric, which means that it has the same measure. If for any two orbits, say O1 and O2, if they have the same cardinality, then the statistic on both is the same. So notice it doesn't say anything about if you take two orbits of different size, all bets are off. But if they have the same size, the statistic evaluates to the same thing on both of them. Now notice this is weaker than, so note, homo messi implies homometry. but not conversely. So this is, a, this is a weaker statement, but sometimes only the weaker statement holds, and you'll see some examples of that in the exercises. So then I just wanted to end with, uh, there's a conjecture in this paper, which nobody seems to have been able to prove yet, but the paper only came out last year, so maybe it's not so hard. So I wanted to show it to you in case any of you had any ideas, because it's a really simple sounding conjecture. You'd think it wouldn't be that hard. So is it on the exercises sure. today? I'm sorry, say what? Is it on the exercises sheet today? Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, this is one of the exercises. Excellent. No, 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 <laughs> we'll solve it this afternoon. <laughs> we'll solve it. This, if you solve it this afternoon, I will be eternally grateful. <laughs> so so let me get this, this up. Yeah, okay. So here's the conjecture. And it and the other frustrating thing is it's about the probably the simplest type of fence you could imagine. Take a, a fence where all these parameters are equal. So let's let F be F U and let's make all the parameters the same thing. Where, as usual, there are going to be T parameters here. Just repeat A any number of times you want. First of all, we believe, and there's lots of evidence in the paper, that if I take the cardinality for the antichains, that that is homometric. Same as long as the cardinalities are the same. And if T is odd, and I can explain why T is odd is a reasonable hypothesis here if people are interested, then the cardinality statistic, not for antichains, but for order ideals is N over two Messick. Where N here is just the number of elements of the fence. Actually, I shouldn't put that there since it's still a conjecture. But yeah, if any of you have any ideas how to attack this, this would be fantastic. <laughs> and with that, I think we're going to end the morning session. Great. Can can we try something? Can everybody unmute and then clap and see if it works? Let's let's let me wait till you guys unmute and then okay. Clap. Yeah, yeah. I can hey, hear there it. we go. I we real applause. In the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming and listening. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you this afternoon. <laughs>